Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here, and today we are going to be discussing five different conditions which, if you have, invalidate or make the TSH test less reliable. In other words, if you have these conditions or, or any of these conditions, you might have one or more, then you can't really trust the TSH as a way to determine what is happening um, in your body and what is happening with your thyroid. So let's jump right in here. The first one is or number one is low T3 syndrome. And this condition um, is defined as a state of low T3. And you can simply test for this with a two tests. You can either use the total T3 or the free T3. Um, and the problem with this condition is that T3 is the most important thyroid hormone available in your body. All right, it's more important than T4 and it's more important than TSH. Those are just ways to look at what's happening with your thyroid. The problem is a lot of doctors don't order the T3 test. What they, they normally order is just the TSH, and they may or may not reflex that test to a free T4. But you'll notice that the free T3 isn't anywhere in there. The problem is you can have a normal TSH, or even a healthy TSH, and you can have a normal T4, but you can also have that combination plus a low T3. And it doesn't matter if your TSH is normal or if your free T4 is normal if your free T3 or total T3 are low. The reason for that is, like I said before, it is the most important measure of thyroid function. Again, you have to look at the free T3 in order to diagnose this, this problem or this syndrome. So just make sure that you're looking at a complete lab test and one that tells you what is happening with your free T4 and free T3. Like I said, really easy to look for. Um, number two is a high TSH but a normal T4. Now what I really mean here, what I'm really talking about, is that TSH, which is in let's let's call it the suboptimal range and so if you look at this example here we have a tsh and the result of this patient is 3.3 and you might look at that and say yeah that's normal but it's not optimal so we'll, we'll look at that so the reference range is 0.35 to 5.5 so technically yes it falls within that range um, the problem is this is a suboptimal level and newer studies have shown that a tsh less than two or maybe pushing it to 2.5 is ideal. Now I personally recommend you have your TSH probably somewhere around one as I believe most healthy people who don't have any weight issues or metabolic issues have a TSH around that range. So even two or 2.1 or especially three tend to be pushing it because of these newer studies that I've mentioned. But the point here is you might be feeling poorly and relying upon your TSH um, because you're thinking it's in that normal range when really it's suboptimal but technically normal. So remember to look at the TSH um, and make sure it's in that optimal range, but also look at it in conjunction with your T4 because you want your T4 again also in that optimal range as well. Number three would be anybody who has a partial thyroidectomy or somebody who has had part of their thyroid irradiated by radioactive iodine. Now the problem here is that your thyroid, if part of it is damaged, can grow or it can hypertrophy it so it grows in size to compensate for the lack of either the part of the thyroid which was removed or the part of the thyroid which was irradiated. Now the problem with that is it has to change how uh, it's sensitive it is to TSH and how it responds to TSH um, so when you look at standard lab tests in that setting they're not going to give you a clear picture of what's happening because obviously your physiology has changed. And so to illustrate this point, I have a patient here who had a partial thyroidectomy. She had half of her thyroid removed, and these were the lab tests that she presented with to me. So you can see she has a TSH of 2.3, which you might say, yeah, that's slightly less than 2.5, but technically in the normal range. But the rest of her, her picture is revealed as you order the more lab tests. So you can see her reverse T3 is elevated. You can see her insulin is quite high, and you can see her free T3 is quite low. And then also, if we were looking, her thyroid globulin antibody is elevated as well. So you can be falsely deceived if you have half of a thyroid or part of a thyroid radiated if you just look at the TSH. But you can't do that because you've altered, like I said, the cellular sensitivity. Um, your thyroid gland has hypertrophied to account for the lost amount of thyroid gland tissue that was there. And all of that comes together to, and it doesn't allow you to look at the TSH in isolation. You need to look at these other tests. And by the way, this patient, once we gave her some NDT, uh, she perked right up, she started losing a ton of weight, and she felt a lot better. So this is just an example that you can't look simply at the TSH, but as she, she kept going into her doctor, 
and the doctor kept saying the TSH is good, so you are good, therefore you are good, and obviously that wasn't working out for her. Number four would be anybody with high TPO antibodies, but a normal TSH, but somebody who has the symptoms of hypothyroidism. And this is, this I would say there's a fair amount of people who have, um, maybe not a, a known diagnosis of Hashimoto's, but a suspected diagnosis of Hashimoto's, who fit into this category. Now, it's, it's fairly well known that there's a subgroup of people, um, well, let, let's put it this way, the, the standard treatment for those people with Hashimoto's is to wait until their their autoimmune disease has destroyed enough of their thyroid gland to warrant putting them on thyroid medication. And so what will often happen in these patients is they'll feel terrible for, you know, they'll progressively get worse and worse and worse over several years until officially their TSH rises above some threshold or some point. And then the doctor will say, now you're hypothyroid, let's give you medication. But it's a spectrum and they get, they get worse and worse and worse over um, some period of time. Now, part of the reason for that is because of how their their thyroid gland is interacting with these elevated antibodies. So the elevated antibodies are slowly destroying and causing inflammation in the thyroid gland, which is limiting its ability to produce enough thyroid hormone. In addition, this inflammation reduces the thyroid's uh, T4's ability to convert from T4 to T3. And so even though their TSH may be relatively normal, you can identify this, this situation early by looking specifically at the thyroid globulin antibodies and the thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And if those are present, even if the TSH is normal, but if you have symptoms of, of hypothyroidism, it's, worth to, it's worthwhile to potentially start treatment early before you wait to that point. So don't look at and don't trust the TSH just by itself if you fit this sort of these cat, the category that I just sort of listed here. And then number five, would be any, uh, number five is increased D2 or deiodinase en enzyme activity. So what this is, is this is a genetic factor that a lot of people have, somewhere between uh, 15 to 20%, and it's a, a genetic mutation that alters how efficiently this enzyme converts T4 to T3. So there's a lot of people who just aren't converting T4 to T3 um, as fast or as efficiently as other people. Now this isn't a problem necessarily unless you also have hypothyroidism, either because you have Hashimoto's or in any a cause really, but anything that puts stress on your thyroid gland and uh, may create a situation in which this mutation can become exacerbated and start to cause symptoms. And the problem is we don't we're not in this we're not in a place where we routinely test for these um, genetic mutations simply because they're just not as, even though it's well documented that they're, that they cause issues, we're not quite sure, or at least the 23andMe testing has not quite come stand, or has not quite become standard yet um, in primary care practices and in endocrinology practices. But the point here is, much like the first one we talked about, low T3, patients with this D2 deiodinase enzyme mutation will have difficulty converting T4 to T3. So they may have a normal TSH, they may have a normal T4, but they'll find you'll probably find with testing that their T3 tends to be much lower. And so they're kind of having, in a way, a low T3-like syndrome as a result of this genetic mutation. So there you have it. These are five different situations which can influence um, how reliable your TSH is. And because of this, and a bunch of other reasons, I recommend whenever you're looking at your thyroid, get more than just your TSH. You need to be looking at the TSH, which it is important, but also look at it in the con in context with free T3, free T4, and reverse T3. When you put all these things together, you'll have a, a, a better picture of what's happening with your thyroid. If you guys have any questions at all about this, hopefully it wasn't confusing, but if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer those in the next day or two. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one.